to my YouTube subscribers around the world. I normally get between 150 and 200 people come on live while I'm doing one of these programs. This is the first time I've done it in this formula setting. Usually I do this at Sammy's Italian Pizza Kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> and so in the last four years we've made a thousand videos. We've had 147 meetings and a thousand videos. And so today I want to talk to you about religious experience. Every religion in the world had as its origin numinous experiences. So there were numinous experiences in every religion at their founding. And then they evolved. And so I'm going to describe a few of mine to begin with. And then later on in the program, I'm going to give you folks an opportunity to say anything that you might have had that might be interesting. But if you do that, just know that whatever you're saying is getting broadcast out to the world and it's going to end up on YouTube. So, but I don't mind if you want to photograph or take notes or have a copy of my presentation afterward. Today, uh, first of all, I want you to think of the yin-yang symbol in Taoism. And I want you to think of psychology as the yin and science as the young. And I'm going to try to stay on the Tao, which is the line between the two. But because that line is infinitely small, it's, I will necessarily be transgressing both sides of the line. And hopefully at the end of it, I, it will be meaningful to you. And I hope I don't get burned at the stake. <laughs> okay, but first I'm going to describe a few of my personal religious experiences. And Dr. Jung made the point, along with Immanuel Kant, that you don't know anything psychologically until you've experienced it yourself. You think of it as Adlerian psychology. You tell a child the stove is hot, they don't know what that means. When they touch the stove now, they know what hot is. And so that's the experience of hot. You have to have the experience, the psychological experience, before you know what hot is. But with anything psychological, you have to have an experience. And so in religion and in psychology, it turns out, uh, much to my surprise, it's important to have the experience, not just talk about it. And so what I'm going to do is talk about what I know. So in 1956, Dr. Young was interviewed by the BBC, and one of the cheeky questions that the interviewer asked was, do you believe in God? And knowing, of course, that Dr. Young's father was a Swiss Reformed pastor, and he had at least seven uncles who were also Swiss Reformed pastors, and he was in around theology all of his life. And Young was rather cagey in his answer. He got a twinkle in his eye, and he said, well, I have no need to believe because I know. And when I saw him say that, I had an epiphany because I said to myself, I too know. But then I had to stop and say, okay, what is it I know that Dr. Young knew in 1956? And so, first of all, let's define numinous. A numinous experience is, it seems supernatural. We're going to talk about it being actually supernatural shortly, but it's mysterious, it's filled with the sense of the presence of divinity and the holy, and it's appealing to the higher emotions and to the ascetic sense. So it seems spiritual. And we probably have an experience like this every day, and hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll be able to recognize them when they happen. One important thing to understand 
is that God manifests in our hour of need. Holborn said in his poem called Patmos, and it's really a poem that's worthwhile looking up. And you may remember from the Bible that the writer of Revelation, the book of Revelation, was John of Patmos. So you might want to look up that poem, Patmos. But Holborn said, where danger is, grows also the rescuing power. We all saw this in The Sound of Music when the Mother Superior said to Maria, uh, when God closes a door, he opens a window. And I'm going to talk to you about how that happens. The most famous example of this is uh, Jesus in Gethsemane, because as you recall, Jesus entered the Garden of Gethsemane after the Last Supper. And he was trying to decide whether it was really his lot or not to go to the cross on the next morning. And he asked his disciples to stay awake and pay attention uh, while he prayed to God. But all of his disciples fell asleep. And he prayed three times, and after each time, his disciples fell asleep, but even while he was praying. But finally, um, an angel came to Jesus, and Jesus went on to the cross. And so this is an idea of developing an indestructible foundation. The highest and most decisive experience of all is to be alone with one's own self. And whatever else one chooses to call the objectivity of the psyche, one must be alone if he is to find out what it is that supports him when he, when he, he can no longer support himself. Only this experience can give him an indestructible, an indestructible foundation. And you'll find that in Collective Works, volume 12, paragraph 32. Now, I've had a few experiences, and in the right corner, you will see a stained glass window, and just to the left of it, there is a pillar. I have often gone into the chapel at the U.S. Naval Academy in times of in times of trouble in my own life. When you see me getting emotional during this talk, you'll see that I'm having an enormous experience as we're talking, and there's one numinous experience that relates to <clears throat> the Navy hymn. I can't even talk about the Navy hymn. I put that after the end, but we'll see if I come back to it. In any case, very often in the morning, uh, about 10 or 10.30 in the morning, I go over to the Naval Academy Chapel if I'm feeling down, very down, and I want to just be with myself. And when I go there, there's never any light on it, like you're seeing in this image. It's very dark in the chapel. And the place I sit, because the main part of the congregation is roped off, the place I sit is on the right side, in the right arm of the chapel, looking up at the stained glass windows on the left. And on that, left side of the chapel is a window that was done by Tiffany. If you've never seen it, it's really worth going to see because you can really see the quality of his stained glass versus that of others. But on this one particular day, which was September 6th, 2016, I was feeling particularly down and I sat down and this pew, which I indicated to you. And suddenly I was lighted up and only me. 
and I'm sitting in this dark chapel and only me is lit up and my attitude <clears throat> changed instantaneously. And so this is the scene I saw looking up at the Tiffany window and the light coming in on me. You can see how dark it was in the chapel on that day at that time. And I looked it up at it and my attitude changed to one of almost euphoria. And I said to myself, oh my God, no one's ever going to believe this unless I take a picture of it. So I pull out my cell phone and I took a picture of it. And there it is. And then I turned a selfie back on myself. And again, you can see how dark it was in the chapel behind me and how only my face was lit up on that occasion. And over my right shoulder there, uh, you can see the stained glass window that I pointed out, which had, now I've shown this to many people around the world in my YouTube channel, and they said, oh, that looks like a gargoyle behind you or something. And I said, no, that's the great seal of the U.S. Naval Academy. And so I took a picture of that same image on a sunny day, and that's what it looks like, a sunny day. And so you can have, you can get the essence of how dark it was that day, and yet how lit up I was on that occasion. Now a year later, well, first of all, I want to talk about synchronicity and coincidence. Now you can say, okay, uh, there's nothing special about that script. It was a coincidence. You know, the sun goes by that point every day, and it probably lights up that pew every day. And that pew is one seat out of seating for 2,000. And you would be right. But synchronicity is a coincidence that has meaning to you. Okay? So it may not have meaning to you, but it has meaning to me. And so what I'm saying is that on that occasion, the light coming on me at that moment, when I was so down, changed my attitude instantly and so it was quite meaningful to me and so a coincidence is you run into your neighbor at the grocery store and you haven't seen him for a while and you say hi how are you and everything's wonderful and you go on with your life and you never think about it again that's a coincidence but a synchronicity is a meaningful coincidence it's one that has special meaning to you in your psyche and so a year later, sometime in 2017, I was back in the chapel in my favorite pew, and I was in an attitude of prayer. And I was very down because I felt that I had been fighting something, uh, which isn't relevant for this talk, but I had been fighting something which I had considered domestic enemies. I've taken I've taken the oath to the Constitution seven times in my lifetime. And one of any each of those I've sworn to defend the nation against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I have five men in my personal knowledge who have given their lives for that oath. And so on this particular occasion, I was back in my favorite pew and I was uh, sort of leaned over in an attitude of prayer and I had a vision. And the vision was
regardless of what my feelings about what was happening. I was a loser in my uh, lawsuit. However, um, these five men blessed me in that vision. Now, I want to talk about another amazing uh, vision. And this vision is recounted in uh, Donald Kalsch's book, uh, Trauma and the Soul. And the story is uh, as recounted by uh, Esther Harding, who was a first disciple, a follower of Dr. Jung. The mother sent her young daughter to her father's study one morning to deliver an important note written on a piece of paper. The little girl went off to deliver the note. Shortly thereafter, the daughter came back in tears and said, I'm sorry, mother, but the angel won't let me go in. Whereupon the mother sent the daughter back a second time with the same result, only this time more tears and distress. At this point, the mother became irritated at her youngster's imaginative excess. So she took her little girl by the hand and the two of them marched the message over to the father. As they entered the father's study, the mother saw her husband slumped in his chair, his drink spilled on the floor, dead from heart attack. Henry Wyatt did a painting about this and about the angel coming and protecting the five-year-old daughter uh, until her mother could intermediate for her about the death of her father. So now I want to talk about this image. And if you looked at the brochure that I put out before this event, you will have had the opportunity to actually watch the video online. And if you haven't seen it, I put copies of the brochure in the back so that you can pick one up too. Get the link to this experience that I had. This is actually the most profound religious experience I ever had. You know, one of the things that I've been trying to understand is what my role with Dr. Young's work is and what I should be doing with it. Dr. Young wrote a famous book called Answer to Joe that was very controversial. It is very controversial to this day. And I was reading it. I read the entire book into the YouTube channel so that people... Something empirically demonstrable comes to our aid from the depths of our unconscious nature. It is the task of the conscious mind to understand these hints. If this does not happen, the process of individuation will nevertheless continue. The only difference is that we become its victims and are dragged along by fate towards the inescapable goal which we might have reached walking upright if only we had taken the trouble and been patient enough to understand in time the meaning of the noumena that cross our path. The only thing that really matters now is whether man can climb up to a higher moral level, to a higher plane of consciousness, in order to be equal to the superhuman powers which the fallen angels have played into his hands. But he can make no progress with himself unless he becomes very much acquainted with his own nature. Unfortunately, a terrifying ignorance prevails in this respect and an equally great aversion in increasing the knowledge of his intrinsic character. However, in the most unexpected quarters nowadays, we find people who can no longer blink the fact that something ought to be done with man in regard to his psychology. Unfortunately, the little word ought tells us that they do not know what to do and do not know the way that leads to the goal. We can, of course, hope for the undeserved grace of God who hears our prayers but God, who also does not hear our prayers, wants to become man, and for that purpose he has chosen, through the Holy Ghost, the creaturely man filled with darkness, the natural man, who is tainted with original sin 
and who learnt the divine arts and sciences from the fallen angels. The guilty man is eminently suitable and is therefore chosen to become the vessel for the continuing incarnation, not the guiltless one who holds aloof from the world and refuses to pay his tribute to life, for in him the dark god would find no room. That's Navy F-18s flying over the Naval Academy football game in Annapolis, Maryland. Paragraph 647. Since the apocalypse, we now know again that God is not only to be loved, but also to be feared. He fills us with evil as well as with good. Otherwise, he would not need to be feared. And because he wants to become man, the uniting of his antinomy must take place in man. This involves man in a new responsibility. He can no longer wriggle out of it on the plea of his littleness and nothingness. For the dark god has slipped the atom bomb and chemical weapons into his hand and given him the power to empty out the apocalyptic vials of wrath on his fellow creatures. Since he has been granted an almost godlike power, he can no longer remain blind and unconscious. He must know something of God's nature and of metaphysical processes if he is to understand himself and thereby achieve gnosis of the divine. As we've just had the Navy F-18s flying over the house, we hear the very power that Dr. Jung was concerned about. In paragraph 747, when Dr. Jung refers to the apocalypse, he's referring to World War II. This book was written 11 years after the end of World War II. Let me read the first sentence of paragraph 747 once again. Since the apocalypse, we now know again that God is not only to be loved, but also to be feared. He fills us with evil as well as with good. Otherwise, he would not need to be feared. And because he wants to become man, the uniting of his antinomy must take place in man. This involves man in This involves man in a new responsibility. Now I become now I become emotional about that because all my life now I become emotional about that because I was raised in the Navy and I was taught by my father to say, go Navy in around Naval Academy football games. What could be wrong with that? But now I do realize that, but now I do realize that those same F-18s deliver evil as well as good. I recall, in the, I recall in the movie Witness where the little boy, Samuel, finds Harrison Ford's pistol and begins to play with it. His grandfather takes the gun away from him and the boy Samuel says, well, we'll only shoot the bad men. And his grandfather says, and how will you know the bad men? 
certainly when you're in an F-18 dropping a bomb, it is very difficult to decide whether it's going to land on a good person or a bad person. Now another one, this was actually a double experience. I mean, one of my numinous experiences was uh, my, the Jackson Pollock piece that I saw at the Boston Museum. And, you know, I'd seen postcards of Jackson Pollock drip paintings before, but I walked into a room and here's a 20 foot by 10 foot drip painting. And, you know, it wasn't spectacular in color. It was sort of olive drab and grays and blacks and a little bit of white in it, but mainly, I mean, my recollection of it is mainly green, okay. Uh, but I walked into this room and I took one look at this thing and all of a sudden I started to sob. Now, to this day, I have no idea. You said Real solid green? Yeah. Well, yeah, okay, maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you may have popped up something here. Who knows? It's possible, yeah. There, there's some connections there. But, but yeah, I mean, you're making me mo emotional about it right now because of that. Yeah, uh, right. Right, and my my roommate from the basic school, um, five months after we graduated as second lieutenants, he was killed in Vietnam on April the 11th, 1969. So now Bill is connected up that Jackson Pollock with Olive Drab with two, and now we're talking about Bob Christian, my roommate. And interestingly, his sister is uh, connected with me in 2005. So there's a very, you know, emotional bond between her and me uh, because Bob was my brother too. He was like my big brother for the time we were in the basic school. But in any case, I didn't have that connection before until until Bill introduced it as a possibility. At a, and it's I'm getting emotional about it right now only because of that. But but at the time, I walked into that room, and this has never happened to me with art. I walked into that room, I looked at that thing, and I started to sob, and I had tears running down my face. And, you know, I almost never remember another time when I sobbed so much. And, um, you know, Jackson Pollock has been dead since 1954. So his unconscious communicated directly to my unconscious without pa passing either one of our conscious minds. You know, that's why the, the great works of art, you can be very moved by them even though the artist is long dead because the, their spirit is still there in some way. And at that same exhibit... But the spirit that came through them is still there. Right, exactly. Right, okay, the spirit that came through them is still there. Now, the next one is sort of interesting. On July the 28th, 2019, I had the opportunity to interview one of the leading union analysts in the world right now, and also the executive director of the Durkheim Center in Germany. Durkheim Center, I'm sorry. And I was speaking to them about their book. Uh, they have a series now called Young's Red Book for Our Time. And this is volume one. Uh, there are now three volumes. And they contain uh, 50 essays by union analysts who are finally coming out about what Ewan's work was really about. And most people don't know what it was really about. It was really about religion. Dr. Young sort of kept that mufti all his life. And for a long time, he left something for someone like me to discover, but he didn't really explain himself that well. He, he wanted you to have to figure out what he had done in the long term. And so the significance of what he did is truly profound. And 
it has been hidden by the Jungian analyst community for a hundred years. And they did that because they were creating a Jungian analyst profession, a mental health profession, which does help many individuals, certainly it does. And they were afraid that if they were honest about what Dr. Young was really saying, outside of just the clinical setting with one-on-one -on -one discussions, they were afraid that they would be offed by the theologians of the world and they're right. This is why I say I have to walk this doubt line between <laughs> the yin and yang of science versus religion. But anyway, uh, they are editing the, this three-volume series, which still is mainly aimed at the fellow Jungian community, but it now is sensible enough that we laymen can understand it. And I'm very enthusiastic about their work. So I was interviewing them on uh, the 28th of July, 2019, and Dr. Stein told me that he had met a grandson of C.G. Jung, and the grandson had told Dr. Stein that C.G. Jung carried a pocket Bible with him everywhere he went, and if he had a spare moment, he could be seen reading it. And I had never thought about having a pocket Bible or anything about pocket Bibles whatsoever. But on the next day, it so happened that this summer, Debbie and I had a house guest who's from Gaza City, and she's Palestinian. And I was in my study about to begin my weekly broadcast on Monday evening, and about five minutes before the broadcast, she walked into the room and handed me this pocket Bible. And I said, wow, okay, this is, this is a Muslim woman who happened to have a pocket Bible, and at that moment, the day after Dr. Stein had told me that, she handed me this Bible and said she wanted me to have it. Of course, if she has little use for it being Muslim. So I consider that a religious experience. Okay, so what are religions about? Religions began as a response to instinct. And if we didn't have the development of religions, uh, we wouldn't have civilization, actually. And so I have an advanced reading group, and about 10 days ago, on our Wednesday advanced group, I was having a conversation with Tim Holmes, who is an outstanding artist, and I've interviewed him, and his interview is on the YouTube channel. But Tim was talking about trying to get at the Adam and Eve story. And we were talking about how a uh, snake had been depicted in historical paintings about the Garden of Eden. And Tim was going on about his thinking about this. And as he talked, I, a vision came into my head. And the vision was that this snake wasn't a little, nice little garden snake. This snake was a huge snake that had come up and was whispering into Eve's ear. So Tim said, well, wait a minute, let me get something. He goes away from his camera for a minute and comes back with his notebook and he showed me this, which is the image that had come up in his mind uh, in the previous week or so, as he's been thinking about that. So here, I'm queuing in to Tim, who happens to live in Helena, Montana, almost simultaneously. And I joked that when, when I did the interview with Tim and then edited it, Tim and I lived together 30 years in those four days. And uh, you may remember the Star Trek episode where Jean Picard gets flashed by some device and he goes unconscious. And while he's unconscious, he lives 30 years on another planet. And on the Enterprise, only 30 seconds have passed. 
and he wakes up from it. But the proof that the 30 years had passed was that he could then play a, a flute and play a song that he learned during the 30 years that related to his wife in that other life. And so this experience for me was very much like that. Tim told me about his life and we went through some severe trials and tribulations getting his interview together so that I could publish him. And then I did four days later, but I really felt like I had lived 30 years with Tim. And so we've become good friends. Now, the psyche talks to us in images. This image is obviously a mandala, and it's always been recognized as an ineffable symbol of God. And obviously it's found in kaleidoscopes, and I've always been sort of interested in kaleidoscopes. At one time I had a beautiful one, but before language even came to us, our psyche has been telling us things through images. And that image doesn't necessarily mean like a photograph. It could be the image of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, for example. You weren't thinking of that before I just mentioned it. But now that I mention it, you can imagine, you can probably imagine all four uh, movements of the Fourth Fifth Symphony and many other Beethoven pieces. And so those images are in our psyches all the time. And, but this one uh, has been in our psyche for quite a long time. And so I'd like you to just now, as you're looking at this particular image, uh, just think about how long, how far back can we prove that this image existed in time, okay? This next slide, is an image from Dr. Young's Red Book. You may have found, you may have heard of the Red Book, and if you've heard of it and not seen it, I've brought my copy here so that you can see it. And this is uh, page 125 of the Red Book. It's a very profound image of a mandala that's a numinous experience being experienced by this guru or adept who was uh, floating over the city of Geneva Switzerland in this particular image, but it's been adopted. The mandala appears everywhere in the world. Uh, this is the rose window in the Cathedral of Notre Dame, at least before the fire. And uh, just as an aside, when I walked into the house on the day that Notre Dame burned, I turned on the television, uh, I sobbed. And the only other time I've ever sobbed like that was the time with the Pollock. And I'm saying to myself, well, what am I sobbing about? I'm not a Catholic. And I have been to Notre Dame. I thought it was a nice church, but you know, on the order of the Naval Academy Chapel. <laughs> so I didn't understand what my connection with that event was. But over the following week, I realized that nothing had been destroyed of importance. Yes, there are some works of art that were lost. I'm not sure about the rose window. I think it survived. But nothing that symbolically you know, the Cathedral of Notre Dame represents was lost. And now there will be artisans and, and other clever people who will make more beautiful works of art to go into Notre Dame. But the essence of the cathedral has not been lost. So in Dr. Young's time, the earliest mandala that he was aware of at that time uh, was 35,000 years old. And it had been found in a cave in Zimbabwe. But since his death, this mandala was found in Kimberley, Australia, 
And this mandala is 50,000 years old. So just to give you an appreciation in the human species of how long this image has been there. And then something su surprising came up. In the 1990s, uh, divers started to find <coughs> mandalas on the seafloor in the Sea of Japan. And they couldn't imagine what these things were. And so over a period of years, they, they studied them and tried to figure out what was creating them. And it took them several years, but what they found was this. This is a puffer fish. This is the uh, so-called fugu fish in Jap Japan. It's the, it's the fish that if you eat it by an incapable chef in Japan in a sushi restaurant, you're going to die because it has a a bladder in it that has poison to humans. And this fish is five inches long. And what it does is over a period of seven days, it creates this mandala. And, and the apparent physical world reason is because after his five day effort of making this mandala, the female puffer fish comes in and lays her eggs in the middle of this mandala. And so, I thought that was a pretty profound fact. And I have a biologist friend, a biology teacher, who told me that human beings separated from these kinds of fish about 200 million years ago. And so that's a profound statement. The psyche talks to us in images, but ultimately we came to the word. And so, in the book of John, of course, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that's the Logos. And so we can thank the Logos for bringing us our civilization. And keep looking back now on the, on the instinct versus religion idea the religions came forth with the word and made it possible for us to develop civilization all over the world, not only in Christianity. But sometimes the word, the logos, can work against us. And so, at the time of Plutarch, Plutarch tells this story in the obsolescence of oracles. Plutarch records the following story he had heard directly from a participant. He said that once upon a time, in making a voyage to Italy, he embarked on a ship carrying freight and many passengers. It was already evening when the Enchiladas Islands, the wind dropped and the ship drifted near Paxi. Almost everybody was awake and a good many had not finished their after dinner wine. Suddenly from the island of Poxy was heard the voice of someone loudly calling Thomas, so that all were amazed. Thomas was an Egyptian pilot, not known by name even to many on board. Twice he was called and made no reply, but the third time he answered and the caller raised his voice saying, when you come opposite the, uh, to Palotis, announced that Great Pan is dead. On hearing this, all were astounded and reasoned among themselves whether it was better to carry out the order or to refuse to meddle and let the matter go. Under the circumstances, Thomas made up his mind that if there should be a breeze, he would sail past, keep quiet, but with no wind and a smooth sea about the place, he would announce what he had heard. So when he came opposite Pelotis, and there was neither wind nor wave, Thomas, from the stern, looking toward the land, said the words he had heard them, Great Pan is dead. Even before he had finished, there was a great cry of lamentation. Not one person, but of many, mingled with exclamations of amazement. As many persons were on the vessel, the story was soon spread abroad in Rome, and Thomas was sent for 
by Tiberius Caesar. Tiberius became so convinced of the truth of the story that he caused an inquiry and investigation to be made about time. So in the 19th century, we have the 19th century balance. God is dead and we have killed him, said Friedrich Nietzsche. What is to be done, we must understand. So Dr. Young actually Envision seven stages of consciousness for, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to limit it to five. So the first stage of consciousness that every human being goes through is what's called participation mystique. And that is you're born, you're a wild animal, you don't know anything about life at all, and you start to imitate your parents and that sort of thing. And that's the psychology of an infant. And gradually, you start to see your parents as gods. This is the second stage. And so I remember in my own experience, my mother, my mother in 1952 was tasked with driving three infants. I was the eldest at age five. My sister was nine months old. And my mother, who was 25 years old at the time, was tasked with driving from Philadelphia to Seattle so that we could get in shipping and go to Kodiak, where my father was being assigned as a naval officer. <laughs> and I specifically recall out in the middle of the Badlands, I don't know where, but my mother was teaching me to read a map so that I could guide her on her travels. And um, I remember specifically looking up at her and thinking that I was in the automobile with the goddess. So I remember that that stage dawning on me. So the third stage is when uh, re the various religions provide us with vessels for God. And as long as those vessels hold, then everything is hunky dory. And we have moral people and we raise moral people and uh, we live in a moral society. But of course, at the end of the 19th century, Nietzsche announced that God was dead. And as Dr. Young observed, he was speaking a truth that was the truth for many people in Europe at that time. It wasn't just him noticing or him saying it, it was him speaking a truth. And so the fourth stage of consciousness, which we have been struggling with is this God of death, God is dead stage, where we have now many atheists and agnostics in our uh, group, and they're all very logos oriented, and they say these Christian myths are uh, not true, and therefore they stop going to church. And the result that we get when that happened was 280 million people killed in the 20th century uh, by wars and many Christians killing other Christians. And so what we call the Enlightenment, which is the period after 1500 when science, the scientific method took over, is really an endarkenment from the point of view of the psyche and the spiritual. And so we've gotten the scientific method, which has given us all these wonderful things that we have, including the possibility of broadcasting this talk around the world, but uh, we've lost our spiritual back bearings. And some people have envisioned that we have got to invent a new religion, but I think that I want to posit for you that we actually have to go back to the old religions, and I'm going to say why, or at least 
give due cognizance of them. Because what's happening right now, there's a philosopher at the University of Toronto, uh, his name is John Verbeke, and he's currently giving a series of 50 talks on awakening from the meaning crisis. Okay, so he's a philosopher, and what are philosophers? They're guys that use rationality and logic. And so he's been giving several weeks worth of definition of what meaning is about. And he's sliced and diced it totally thoroughly. And basically what he's given is a dictionary definition of meaning. But the problem is that the meaning crisis isn't about that. The meaning crisis is about our spiritual life. It's not about the logos. And so when he does that, he's specifically missing the point. And so what happens, first of all, we have to understand, theologians and psychologists are in the same business, really. For thousands of years, the mind, the mind of man has worried about the sick soul, perhaps even earlier than it did about the sick body. The propitiation of God's, the perils of the soul and its salvation, these are not yesterday's problems. Religions are naturally evolved, and I've added those two white words there, naturally evolved. Religions are naturally evolved psychotherapeutic systems in the truest sense of the word and on the grandest scale. They express the whole range of the psychic problem in mighty images. They are the avowal and recognition of the soul, and at the same time, the revelation of the soul's nature. And so if you go with a philosopher, a, a Logos guy, a rational guy, uh, John Verbeke wants to create a Wikipedia page in which he's going to invent a new religion. He says, oh, we're not going back to those old religions. Well, we're going to invent a new religion, and we're going to do it on Wikipedia. And this is what happens when you try to uh, invent a new religion, and this actually goes back to about 1500, when a man named Sebastian Brandt tried to draw an image which identified all the things that were associated in the Bible with uh, the Apostle John and the Apostle Luke in these two images. And this is what you get. And of course, it has no meaning to a Christian, okay, even though we've heard about probably all the different elements that you see in this, in this image. Uh, it, so creating a, a new religion with, where religions are naturally evolved is like saying that you're going to create an artificial arm for the one that was evolved. Okay, it might, it might work a little bit, uh, like your artificial arm might work a little bit, but it's not going to be the same as a naturally evolved religion. And that's why I believe that we have to go back and reevaluate the religions we've always had, all of them. Okay? And this, this room with evidence of uh, the ten great religions, I think it's ten, or is it eight? I guess it's eight that are recognized in this room. We have to uh, go back and think about what it is that they have for us. Now we have to distinguish logos from life. So everything in this room is the result of logos. We have to have logos because even we, the potted plants, had to be built according to a plan, and that's all logos. But everything in this room was first the result of Eros. It was first had to be imagined or in the fantasy of someone. Nothing was built without first being imagined by its creator. Even we were once a glint in our father's eye. And so the point is that the rationalists keep poo-pooing fantasy and imagination. They keep poo-pooing art education and music education, for example. But those are the things that teach us how to be innovative in the first place. 
And so if we go to the extreme of the logos, then we don't have a very full life. And this is an image that I took outside where I live. And uh, so the logos brought us materialism, which leaves us spiritually empty. And the owner of this boat recognizes that because the name of his boat is never enough. Mm. And I had a boat at one time, we had a boat. And the first thing my partner and I, who bought it together, said when we went out into the bay was we need a bigger boat. And you know, so that's all great, but uh, the problem is when you, when you live your life based on materialism, it's never enough, and the boat sits at the dock most of the time. That's an issue. Okay, so there's some fallacies about teaching religion through the Logos only. Uh, there's a Roman Catholic bishop named Robert Barron on the West Coast, and he is uh, the chairman. He says on video that he's the chairman of a committee of Roman Catholic bi bishops whose task it is to bring people back into the church. But the results are that they're losing six Catholics for every new Catholic. And he ponders in a video, maybe we have to teach the catechism better. You know, I think to myself, well, maybe you have to connect up your religion to the life of the people better first. And uh, I have a friend uh, who's a Calvinist pastor in Sacramento. His name is Paul Vanderclay. He's quite uh, well known on the internet. And he has a quandary too, because he's teaching uh, religion through the word, which is uh, the way he was taught to do, I'm sure, in divinity school. But what I realized, something was bothering me about all the videos that Paul has been making, and I realized that he was taught to teach religion the way uh, an attorney prepares a case for a jury. And, uh, and it doesn't necessarily touch you. Okay, it doesn't touch where you live. Okay, it doesn't touch the psyche. You might convince somebody, but if you're going to bring people back to religion, you have to find a way to reach them where they live. And finally, there's a well-known psychologist named Jordan Peterson. Uh, he's made a lot of uh, videos over the last several years. He's quite well-known. He's got a couple million followers on YouTube. and. Uh, he did a series of 13 videos on connecting the Bible up to uh, psychological ideas, logos, from the logos point of view. And he said, I want to rescue the logos. And so Dr. Peterson has been asked numerous times from his audiences, he has two extremely successful books. One is called Maps of Meaning, uh, and the other is called 12 Rules of Life. Many, many times he's been asked, do you believe in God? And he just can't say it. He just can't. Uh, if you watch hit the videos where he discusses, how can anybody dare say that they believe in God? He can't say it. He says, I believe as if God exists, as if. And so that's a problem, because that's where we've gone wrong, it seems to me. Now, the fallacies in the scientific method. So the success of science depends entirely on what it, it refuses to look at. The only reason science gets to explain everything is because it gets to say what everything is. If you or I want to put things on the table that science cannot study, those things are dismissed as not real or merely anecdotal, and so they are taken off the table. Science can explain everything because science can control what's on the table. Of course, the scientific method is the best way to understand everything on the table because the scientific method determines what goes on the table and what does not. And that's a quote from a book called The Flip, Epiphan Epiphanies of the Mind and the 
teacher of knowledge by Dr. Jeffrey Cripple. But the problem is that not everything can be solved for X. First of all, what the rationalist will say is that when you believe in God, you're believing in something that's supernatural, and that's like Santa Claus or the Truth Tooth Fairy or Easter, the Easter Bunny. But the truth is that there are things that are supernatural, and those include the God image, the self, which is the deepest archetype in the unconscious, the collective unconscious, dreams and visions. And so Dr. Young analyzed over 80,000 dreams in his career, over a 60 year career as a psychiatrist. And what he could prove empirically in his clinic was that there is an archetype uh, in the unconscious at the deepest level, which has been variously called uh, the God image or the self. And he always made the point that he wasn't talking about the metaphysical God because he believed that that was the purview of theologians. So when I'm talking about this, I'm not talking about the metaphysical God. I'm talking about the God as Dr. Young found it, which is uh, the mandala and various other things like that. It's also called the greater personality. And it's a part of nature. It's supernatural, not supernatural and it is in the deepest part of the unconscious. Now this has been known for hundreds of years. This is an image called Vierge Aubert, which means the open virgin. And on the left, you see the Virgin Mary with the Christ child. But inside the box, if you open the box, you find that the woman in the nun's habit is actually Mother Nature, and within her is God, and God is holding up his son, Jesus Christ. And so the fact that God, in this sense, is supernatural was already known in the 15th, 16th century, but this image was repressed by the Catholic Church. So images like this appeared uh, throughout Europe uh, during the 16th century, and they were very uh, quickly repressed as idolatry. But we have to grow up. So we live in two worlds, and they are both this one. It does not matter at all that a physically impossible fact is asserted because all religious assertions are physical impossibilities. If they were not so, they would, as I said earlier, necessarily be treated in the textbooks of natural science. But religious statements, without exception, have to do with the reality of the psyche and not with the reality of the physis. Now, to me, that's one of the most profound things uh, that Dr. Young said during his career. And so, uh, when I read that, I said, Okay, so in the beginning was the word, but hasn't anything happened since the beginning? What, what came up later, what might have come up later between the Apostle John writing in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, up until the 16th century when you get that image. And uh, so I went back to my Bible and I decided to look it up. And so I looked up John 1.1. 1, 1. <coughs> I didn't have to wait too long because, oh, by the way, in John 1, 4, it says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And in John 1, 12, it says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name. And so the point is that even in biblical times, Christ envisioned others being sons of God, not only him. And yet that has been repressed by the church for 2,000 years. We've become participants in the divine life. We've become participants and we have to assume a new responsibility. That is the continuation of the divine self-realization 
which expresses itself in the task of our individuation. Individuation does not only mean that man has become truly human, as distinct from animal, but that he is to become partially divine as well. This means practically that he becomes adult, responsible for his existence, knowing that he does not only depend on God, but that God also depends on man. Man's relation to God probably has to undergo a certain important change. Instead of the propitiating praise to an unpredictable king or the child's prayer to a loving father, the responsible living and fulfilling of the divine will in us will be our form of worship of and commerce with God. His goodness means grace and light and his dark side, the terrible temptation to power. Man has already received so much knowledge that he can destroy his own planet. Let us hope that God's good spirit will guide him in his decisions because it will depend upon man's decision whether God's creation will continue. Nothing shows more drastically than this possibility, how much of divine power has come within the reach of man. Although the divine incarnation is a cosmic and absolute event, it only manifests empirically in those relatively few individuals capable of enough consciousness to make ethical decisions, i.e. to decide for the good. Therefore, God can be called good only in as much as he is able to manifest his goodness in individuals. That is why he incarnates. Individuation and individual existence are indispensable for the transformation of God the Creator. There's an old Cherokee legend. Um, it's not only Dr. Young that thought about this. There's an old Cherokee legend that goes like this. Grandfather takes his grandson out, out fishing, and he says to his grand, thought, grandson, a fight is going on inside me. It is a terrible fight, and it is between two wolves. One is evil, anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, and guilt. The other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The grandson looks up at his grandfather and says, which wolf wins? And the answer is, the one you feed. So Dr. Young, in the last 10 days of his life, was writing in his book, Man and His Symbols. And this is the uh, one of the last things in his 60 years of writing, maybe more than that, but within 10 days of his death, he wrote this. As any change must begin somewhere, it is the single individual who will experience it and carry it through. The change must indeed begin with an individual. It might be any one of us. Nobody can afford to look around and to wait for somebody else to do what he is loath to do himself. But since nobody seems to know what to do, it might be worthwhile for each of us to ask himself whether by any chance his or her unconscious may know something that will help us. Certainly the conscious mind seems unable to do anything useful in this respect. Man today is painfully aware of the fact that neither his great religions nor his various philosophies seem to provide him with those powerful animating ideas that would give him the security he needs in the face of the present condition of the world. So there's a great task ahead of us, and it's ahead for all theologians and 
maybe all psychologists as well. And the great task is the reinterpretation of all of the major religions according to modern categories of understanding. Rationalists would like to do away with religions based after the matter of the Proctophantasmus in Faust. Are you still here? Nay, it's a thing unheard. Vanish at once, we've said the enlightening word. You're still looking back to the Pentecostal events in a day's way, instead of looking forward to the goal the Spirit is leading us to. Therefore, mankind is wholly unprepared for the things to come. Man is compelled by divine forces to go forward to increasing consciousness and cognition, developing further and further away from his religious background because he does not understand it anymore. His religious teachers and leaders are still hypnotized by the beginnings of the new eon of consciousness instead of understanding them and their implications. What one once called the Holy Ghost is an impelling force creating wider consciousness and responsibility, and thus enriched cognition. The real history of the world seems to be the progressive incarnation of the deity. This is a letter from Dr. Young to the Reverend Mark Kelsey, 8 May, 1958. It's found in a book that Dr. Edward Edinger wrote entitled uh, The New God Image. And there were 14 letters of Dr. Jung's that were basically hidden away by the Jungian community. Seven of them appear in volume 18 of the collected works of C.G. Jung. So if you're really diligent, you might find them there. Seven of them were never published until Dr. Edinger published them. I've read all 14 letters onto the YouTube channel, and you can hear them there. So this is our job. We see a child running between trees in twilight with his friend. He ignores the call to dinner, cannot bear anything, cannot see anything but the sound and illumination of his happiness. While we know, we have seen the charts, that he will die of leukemia. At such a moment, we can find unbearable the juxtaposition of innocence and the suffering to come. The thought that the happiness in question is entirely illusory. It is hard to have the grand view of the angel at the same time as we have the intimate view of the boy who wants to run and run forever. We have to acknowledge that the child was happy, looking forward to a future that would not be his. We have to say that life itself is beautiful before we talk about outcomes. Everything we taste is snatched from death. Our responsibility is to taste it completely. We betray the angel's view because we must. Those we love die, yet we must eat. We must sing. We must love them anyway. That is our job. We may have the angel's view as well as the child's, but not instead of it. When we stop singing, it is our time, and we too go into the dark. And that's quoted from a book by John Tarrant entitled The Light Inside the Dark, which was quoted in Dr. Donald Kalsch's book, Trauma and the Soul. I'm grateful to Tim Holmes, my artist friend in Helena, Montana, for giving my attention to this uh, passage from Scripture. I can begin with my own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge, and I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is vexation of the spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. And that's from Ecclesiastes 1, 16 to 18. 
So the great thing is now and here, and this is the eternal moment. And if you do not realize it, you have missed the best part of life. You have missed the realization that you were once the carrier of life contained between the poles of an unimaginable future and an unimaginably remote past. Millions of years and untroubled millions of ancestors have worked up to this moment, and you are the fulfillment of this moment. Anything that is past is no longer reality, and anything that will be is not yet reality. Reality is now. One should take each moment as the eternal moment, as if nothing were ever going to change, not anticipating a faraway future. For the future always grows out of that which is, and it cannot be sound if it grows in a morbid soil. If we are morbid and don't feel this here and now, then we naturally will build up a sickly future. You must live life in such a spirit that you make in every moment the best of the possibilities. So thank you for sharing this moment with me. I'd love to hear any comments or uh, hear some of your religious experiences, and I'll re be happy to respond to any questions and comments. There is a love offering set up in the back, and just for your information, the love offering will be received for the benefit of Unity by the Bay and ACT, a community of transformation. Uh, no part of your offering will go to either Skip Conover or other participants in this program, including the videographer, although I will be making a contribution uh, because of the videographer <laughs> being so kind. There's a long story behind that, which I'll spare you for the moment. But anyway, um, there are quite a number of people who I appreciate helping me. I'm just like you read about them here on the slide and let me open the floor. Does anybody want to say anything or is, have I shocked them all of you? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, I find your talk to be very fascinating. I appreciate your, your uh, enlightened point of view. And uh, I wanted to ask you about, you seem to it's going to be a personal question, I hope you don't mind. I, I don't mind, but if you don't mind, I'm going to take a chair. Yeah, what I was saying was is I, I found your talk very fascinating and enlightening. For me, it's some things I've been thinking about. You covered, uh, I did a talk about a car yard and synchronicity here at Unity by the Bay. So, uh, quite fascinating to me. But you spoke about some, and at a point I wanted to say this, I noticed that you were very seem to be a very educated man. You seem to have studied ac academics, maybe. I don't. I don't know. Well, um, yeah, I, I, I've done a lot of education. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but my, what, what I want the point I wanted or the question I wanted to to entertain have you entertain is the idea of the supra natural. Am I saying that right? Not supernatural. The right. supra. Yeah. Natural. That that is a real state of existence. Right. Okay. And so that state, it seems to me that our educational system, our educational process negates that understanding in the beginning. As a young child, we're not engaged in a supranatural understanding. We're engaged and the concept of, I'm going to say, hunter-gatherer concept where we're taught to go out and get, hoard, and keep for our own security. And that the supernatural might indicate a different way of living. But well, that, I mean, that was supernatural uh, when we were descending from earlier animals, certainly. Early humans were definitely hunter-gatherers, but we've actually developed beyond that long ago uh, in the last 2,000 years. And 
the Abrahamic religions have served humanity pretty well up, up until 1500, definitely. And after 1500, quite well up until the time of Nietzsche. By that time, by the end of the 19th century, uh, most Westerners were hearing the scientific method shooting holes in the religious myths. And they were saying, well, that isn't true, so why am I going to church, right? But the problem, the issue is, and I brought a couple of books about this to show you, the issue is that religious stories aren't ancient stories. They're stories about us right now, okay, in all religions. And so um, Dr. Edinger wrote, couple of books. Uh, one is called, or he wrote 17 books, but a couple that are relevant to this question, which are uh, a Christian architect, the Union study of the life of Christ, and uh, another is uh, the Bible and the Psyche, which is about the Old Testament. And the basic lesson that is contained in both of those books is that the events of the ancients are actually our events, and they're happening to us every day. And in the last about 10 days, I've read the 12 chapters that cover the 12 events of the life of Christ, the 12 archetypal events of the life of Christ into the YouTube channel, so you can just go and hear them. Inner City Books still publishes the book, and so what you can see from what Dr. Edinger taught us, and unfortunately he died in 1998, he taught us that these stories, these biblical stories, are really us, and they're not ancient stories. They're stories about every human being, every day of every year, from now, forever. And uh, unfortunately, it seems that traditional religions have lost touch with that. And so they haven't been able to connect the stories to modern life. And that's why this great task is before us, the great task of re-envisioning the great religions. Because if you talk to Paul Vanderclay, he can give you all this logical theory going back forever through Aquinas and all those people about why you should believe in God and why why these stories are true, but they never really say that this story is about you. Okay, they never really say that. And I've, I've gone to church for, you know, I'm 73 years old now, so uh, I've, got, I've been to a lot of church. And I think they've lost meaning. I, I fundamentally do. And, uh, revivify that meaning in a in a meaning in a way that connects to people. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you're using the word religion and and the church. I'm talking about creeds. So okay, and, and so what I'm what I'm hearing you say uh, is that we that there is a job to be done, a change, a change needs to take place and how we realize our existence. Absolutely, it needs to take place. I right. hired Bishop Barron saying, I'm the head of the, of the committee of Catholic bishops that's, in, that's supposed to be bringing people into the church, and he says his results are they're losing six. But well, why the church? Pardon? Why the church? Why Why should it be limited to? That's, that's kind of where it, I'm It can be anything. Right. It, it could be, be whatever your religion is, okay? And so, why religion? Why does it need to be? Well, because religion is the, is a generic term that we use. Yeah. To so that's my yeah. So that's what I'm trying to get at. I'm trying to get at a shift into understanding the true our true nature. Right. Which I think you touched upon. Right. Our true nature. Religion is is an attempt. To try to guide us in that process, absolutely. But and it's all been, of them are that. yeah. So it's, but it's, it's been 
corralled into a, a political, there's some issues with religion. Well, because, because of the so-called power devil. That's right, right, right. So our job, our job as I see it, is to expand out from religion and maybe go into other areas to, I mean, find, to find ways to connect. But right. what we need to remember is that it shouldn't be done all logically. It has to be done by the heart, from the heart. Right. So what the little point I was trying to get at is perhaps in our process of education, our education system, as first kindergarten, first grade, you know, all down right the line. Sure. Uh, that we're taught more about the supra-natural process right. as opposed to first instilling the idea of one plus one equals two and you must learn to go out and get two Perfect. or you're not going to make it. Right. And if you get two or somebody else gets two before you do, you have a problem. You that, may not have a boat that's sitting at the marina. <laughs> right. That to me seems to be a major, a major issue with our society. Right. That we teach the problem. We're teaching the problem to our young people instead of understanding that there is a natural process. Right. Religion has been going, hey, <laughs> hello. There's something else. Yes. <laughs> right. Wake right. up. And we keep teaching the same process throughout. Right. So don't misunderstand me. You have to teach religion or anything, even this thought, through the word, okay, right. obviously. And, and that's inevitable. But what religion points to is not rationality. It talks to the heart. And if we don't have a life that's based on that, then we're no longer human beings, then we become robots. And what our educational system has done has turned our educational system into creating robots, teach them enough to uh, balance a checkbook and uh, read a little bit and send them out at, to flip burgers at, at uh, McDonald's. And But we don't teach people to think, we don't teach people the process of learning and knowing and rocking, okay, so Robert Heinlein, the, um, the novelist, wrote a book called, uh, what, what is it? Uh, uh, I'm not remembering. I, I don't recall, but anyway, if you look up Grok, G-R-O-K, on the internet to find Grok, you will find that that, is a, that has a meaning that's far beyond understanding. It's a, it's a, it has a meaning of actually assimilating into yourself what, it, what it's like to be the other, for one, for one thing. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't know those things at, at depth in, in our psychology, know them rather than believe them, then we're, we're going to have a very superficial life. I mean, that's true of us as individuals. Now, I, I don't want to misspeak about what ACT's doing, because of course ACT is publishing a book about working together, and of course you have to work together, but the individuals who put the book together, the book that is coming out on November 10th called Circular Leadership, that book had as its origin probably one person initially, and, and then finally I think 19 people have contributed to the book. And so that 19 people can interact with one another and be a circle of leadership that can lead others. Okay, and so there, don't misunderstand me when, or Dr. Jung when we're talking about the individual, but nonetheless, each of us has to examine ourselves first. We have to know ourselves. And that's actually the motto of <coughs> college, which is know thyself. And, and you probably know so, it's also on the, on the door of the Oracle of Delphi. 
So just to follow, just to, so I, I understand uh, what you're saying, which I think is, is very good. You're saying it's up to us as individuals now. Not the, there's not a system, there's not an educational system uh, right now, or there's not this system or that. We as individuals sitting here now have to discern what the next step is. What the, in the moment, right now, right. in our hearts, discern what the divine action is in every interaction that we have, period. I mean, period. period. Right. right. This so, is the eternal moment. Right. So right. when we're buying a car or when we're, in, uh, whatever it is, whatever we're engaged in, we need to be aware of this is not only a business transaction, this is not only I get, you don't get, or whatever. There is a divine interaction that is taking place. Precisely. Yeah. And so that's where the change, you think that's where the change takes place, that us as adults. Right. We have to people, grow up. We, okay. We can't, we can't just rely on our government or our politicians or our educators to do things for us. We yeah. have to make changes ourselves to the extent we can. Okay, some can do some things. I mean, I'm giving this talk and I have you here listening to me. Uh, and so this is the eternal moment for us. You know, all of your ancestors worked up to this moment and, and they lived their lives so that you could be here talking to me. And all of mine did the same. Each of us has a responsibility to grow up and see what the best thing is to be done and not rely on someone else to do it for us. Ma'am, did you want to have a question? Um, I was going to make a statement that um, Sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, for me, the, the most, almost the most important part of your speaking today is, is exactly what we're speaking about right now, this eternal moment. I think that for me, a lot of, um, you know, religions, do what you said, which is you focus more on the past than the future. And, you know, it's one thing to review the past, but if we're not looking to the future or this particular moment, which is part of the future in a sense, right. um, we're not really going anywhere or getting anywhere. And I think humanity in general loves to like look at the past, let us look at the past and just, you know, keep looking at it. But if we're not looking to the future and saying, what are we going to do in the future? Or what am I doing in this present moment? Which is, in a sense, part of the future. Right. We're not going to get to where we want to be. And where do we want to be? I feel like you're saying, we want to be God on earth. We want to be showing up as God, as spirit, as the light. Right. And so what I love to know about this especially was this very end piece about where am I right now? How am I showing up right now? Yeah. And how is that going to affect the future? Well, I very much appreciate you being so here. I thank you for that. And, and sharing an eternal moment with me. And, and I hope that has uh, something going forward. Yes, sir. Excuse me. Uh, recently for me in terms of understanding and addressing addressing where I am what's going on how to be present is love is the answer what is the question could you give um, some assistance in how we attend to this transition of being heart-centered and the trans our, what transition our transition into being heart-centered Heart center. Yeah, I have something on that. After thinking about it for 85 years, Dr. Yuan did almost the last thing that he said in his life is in a book called Memories, Dreams, Reflections. He never allowed a logos based biography or autobiography. He didn't care about what the events of his life were. But he wanted to express the, the spiritual events that had made the difference, that changed his life through, through his lifetime. 
And so that's why he wrote Memory Streams Reflections to cover the, the main things, the numinous things in his life. And so the last chapter of his book, I don't know if this answers your question, we can amplify your question, but I'll just read to you this uh, one page. At this point, the fact, the fact forces itself on my attention that beside the field of reflection, there is another equally broad, if not broader, area in which rational understanding and rational modes of representation find scarcely anything they are able to grasp. This is the realm of Eros. In classical times, when such things were properly understood, witness the, the uh, beers over Eros was considered a god whose divinity transcended our human limits and who therefore could neither be comprehended nor represented in any way. I might, as many before me, have attempted to do, venture and approach to this daemon whose range of activity extends from the endless spaces of the heavens to the dark abysses of hell. But I falter before the task of finding the language which might adequately express the incalculable paradoxes of love. Eros is a cosmogonist, a creator and father-mother of all higher consciousness. I sometimes feel that Paul's words, quote, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, I have not love, unquote, might well be the first condition of all cognition and the quintessential and the quintessence of divinity itself. Whatever the learned interpretation may be of the sentence, God is love, the word of formal complexio oppositorum of the Godhead. In my medical experience, as well as in my own life, I have again and again been faced with the mystery of love and have never been able to explain it. Like Job, I had to lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not answer. Job 40, 4 through 4 and following. Here is the greatest and the smallest, the remotest and the nearest, the highest and the lowest, and we cannot discuss one side of it without discussing the other. No language is adequate to this paradox. Whatever one can say, no words express the whole. To speak of partial aspects is always too much or too little, for only the whole is meaningful. Love bears all things and endures all things. 1 Corinthians 13, 7. These words say all there is to be said. Nothing can be added to them. For we are, in the deepest sense, the victims and the instruments of cosmogonic love. I put the word in quotation marks to indicate that I do not use it in its connotations of desiring, preferring, favoring, wishing, and similar feelings but it's something superior to the individual, a unified and undivided whole. Being a part, man cannot grasp the whole. He is at its mercy. He may assent to it or rebel against it, but he is always caught up by it and enclosed within it. He is dependent upon it and is sustained by it. Love is his light and his darkness, whose end he cannot see. Love ceases not. Whether he speaks with the tongues of angels or with the scientific exactitude traces the life of the cell down to the uttermost source, man can try to name love, showering upon it all the names at his command, and still he will involve himself in endless self-deception. If he possesses a grain of wisdom, he will lay down his arms and name the unknown by the more unknown ignotum per ignotius. That is by the name of God. That is a confession of his subjection, 
his imperfection and his dependence, but at the same time, a testimony to his freedom to choose between truth and error. I don't know if that covered it, but I wanted to sneak that in. <laughs> that, that covered it very really well. Thank you. What uh, what Kevin what Kevin was sharing um, moved me to that, um, and the realization then helped me here that um, what we are about is to understand our own truth about that we are love Absolutely. and we were created as we are intended to be and to act as and live out as easy said right and the, and the problem is we've we've been living one-sidedly for 500 years okay in other words when the when the when the logos really took over in 1500 and the scientific method came forth it it basically fought, forced everyone over into this materialistic way of being. I mean, I've seen it dramatically in the last 40 years in business schools. Okay, I attended a, a rather quantitative business school. It was based on, I joke that it's 15 courses in statistics by different names. I learned three things in business school, but none of them were in the classroom because once I left business school, I never did a, did a statistical analysis like the ones they teach you in business school because you have to be the census or something like that to have a large enough uh, population for it to be very meaningful. And, uh, but they never told me that in business school. And so at the time I was in business school, we still had three interest groups in companies, okay? The interest groups were um, the shareholders, the management, the employees. Uh, what's happened over the last 30 years by relying on uh, only the logos on statistics and the bottom line is that it, it now has only become for the managers. So uh, now we have these astronomical salaries that are being paid to a very few people and everybody else is just being, being treated as a cog in the wheel. And uh, as long as we put up with that, um, we're going to be dominated by these uh, psychopathic forces. It's, it's, psycho, it's psychopathy, actually. It follows the course from Milton Friedman on. Uh, and, you know, I was all in. In 1976, when Milton Friedman came out with Free to Choose, uh, and everything is logical and everything is the bottom line, I was all in, absolutely. What I learned, uh, quite painfully, is it's not right, it's wrong. And if you do everything like they say, it doesn't necessarily work out. So we have to rethink our education, beginning with kindergarten, okay, because we have to teach children to be able to think. And you can only think if you can create something. And if you have to follow all the rules, then you might as well be a robot. Then we can have that artificial intelligence. But if we want the human species to go up to this next stage of consciousness, then we have to not only look back to the all the religions, all of them, not only Christianity or the Abrahamic religions, but all of them, we have to look back and reanalyze them in terms of modern categories of understanding. We have to stop being hypnotized, as Dr. Jung said, by the Pentecost and understand what it is that we're being taught and what we are teaching. I mean, that's, that's the task for theologians to do. It seems to me it's a full employment bill for theologians to get busy on, and uh, most psychologists too, because right now we're killing, uh, last year we killed, what, 75,000 people with drugs and opioids. So we've been treating people with uh, uh, depression and other ailments, neurosis, with pills instead of fixing what the problem is. 
You know, people were fixed by religion over many years. I mean, the religions are naturally evolved, as Dr. Jung said, naturally evolved methods of dealing with the troubles of man. And our knowledge got away from us after, after 1500. Our knowledge got away from us. I mean, the, the um, way of saying it is uh, God fell off the roof of the cathedral and into the psyche of man. Well, that's where it is. That's where it always has been. I mean, if you go back and read the Bible carefully, what you will find is that the numinous experiences in the Bible were all dreams or visions. And dreams or visions, as Dr. Young has taught, are all messages to us. Okay, they're very important messages to us. And we've been taught to either disregard them or they're unimportant. But but they're they're very important. You know, our unconscious does lots of things. It makes our heart beat and our our lungs breathe and so on, and it makes our cells reproduce and all the things that it does. But the only thing it does with our consciousness is communicate with us uh, things that it thinks we need to know that come through images. And they come sometimes very dramatically. Okay, the images that I described in this talk uh, are how I've been communicated with, but I'll just give you another very practical one. I've never needed a radar detector. Okay, the reason I don't need a radar protector is because every, th every time there's police activity anywhere near me, I get a vision of a police car moving from right to left across in front of my eyes. And it's a black and white and hence the word police on the side. And every time I have that vision, within one to two minutes, I will see police activity. Sometimes it's a, it's a, speed trap, but other times it can be somebody on the side of the road or whatever it is, but it never fails. Every time I have that vision, I immediately know that I'm going to have, I'm going to see police activity very soon. And I've learned to recognize that as my self, my unconscious communicating with me. But I'll just show you a, a, the substance of one of the letters of the Reverend David Cox, and you can hear this entire letter on the website. Uh, Dr. Young said that when he was speaking with intelligent people, he could give them a few equivalencies. One of the equivalencies is that God equals the other conscious. Uh, one is Christ equals uh, the self, and by the self he meant the God image, the, the deepest archetype in the unconscious. And as I've been read, reading Edinger's book, which you can peruse here if you like, you can see why the story of Christ is really the story of all of us. And uh, we need to understand that. Incarnation is integration of these ideas into our own uh, psyche. Salvation is individuation. Um, individuation is an entire two-hour talk, so I'm not going to get into it today, but basically everything, uh, something like an oak tree, an oak tree is an oak tree, but every oak tree is different. And so that oak tree, when the acorn is planted, already has in it everything that it needs to become that specific oak tree. So you can recognize it both as an oak tree, but also as an individual. And so human beings are like that too. And that's what individuation is about. And crucifixion is wholeness, which is understanding that whatever it is that you hate, uh, that too is in you, whatever it is. And so if you look at current events on television these days, whoever it is you hate on the television, regardless red or blue, whoever that is, uh, that person you hate is also in you because you're projecting that on that person. Mm -hmm. And if you can understand that, it makes you a better person. Okay. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's a letter to uh, David Cox. And it was 
September 25th, 1957. It's in CGO Letters, Volume 2. Is that still going? It's still going. Thank you to everyone around the world who's been watching this presentation. I hope it's been useful. And uh, thank you, uh, Carol, for helping. I just will honor our commitment to you. Get out of here. Uh, so anything else? Quickly for we do have refreshments. Oh, yes, we have these refreshments if you'd like to have something to drink or cookies outside. I'm sorry for my YouTube followers for not being able to offer <laughs> that. But in any case, thank you again. And thank you, Carol, for everything. So. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>